Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I will be your host. This is the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Manet and Impressionism live stream program. Thanks for taking time out of your day to be with us. Let's go ahead and get underway. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So if you're watching live on Zoom or Facebook, you can let us know your first name, where you're connecting from, and who's your favorite artist and or type of art. It's always fascinating to find out where people are joining us from and to learn more about them. We don't do a Zoom demonstration for these programs, but just very briefly, there's usually only a couple things that people ever have questions or concerns on. One is the sound. So everyone will be in listen only mode or muted. If you do want to raise or lower the volume on your session, you can check the settings locally on your own device. If you want to adjust the screen display so that the slides and the videos that we're showing take up the full screen, if that's not currently happening for you, look for something called either view or view options, which is usually on the top of a person's device. And you can adjust that at your own end. Throughout our program, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, opinions, ideas, perspectives, memories, etc., etc., feel free to share those in the chat or the Q&A. One of my favorite parts of doing these programs is hearing what all of you think. So appreciate your participation in that. I'll be your host. My name is Robert Kellerman. I'm the founder and director of the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Organization. And we're a nonprofit organization based, of course, in Washington, D.C. We give people the opportunity to experience the history and culture of Washington, D.C. and the world. And so today we're going off to New York City. We've actually been doing quite a few of these live stream art programs covering different museums. So in the D.C. city itself, we've done the National Gallery of Art and the Smithsonian American Art Museum and Portrait Gallery in the United States, but outside of DC. We've done the Detroit Institute of Arts, my former employer, shout out to them. We've also done the Metropolitan Museum of Art previously and doing them again today. The Art Institute Chicago, the Museum of Modern Art, Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the Barnes Foundation. And then museums we do outside the US are the Van Gogh Museum and the Louvre. And of course, more to come. So thanks for your encouragement and support. Greatly appreciate that. This program is being recorded, so if you have to drop off at any point in time, um, or you want to watch it again, or you know anybody else that might be interested in listening to this, you can check it out on our YouTube page, probably posted later on this evening. So let's go off to New York City and visit the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of the world's great museums. And our program is a series of ones we're going to be doing focusing on impressionism at the Met. And I thought what we would do is break up the programs by artist. So next month, we're going to be doing Degas. So you can join us for that. But today, we're going to be talking about Edouard Manet. So let's go ahead and get started. Edouard Manet, born January 23rd, 1832. He passed away on April 30th, 1883. This is perhaps his most famous painting, or at least one of them, and it just so happens to be at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So I thought what we would do, our overview of our program, is to learn about Edouard Manet and Impressionism through the amazing art collection they have at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They just so happen to have numerous Manet paintings, including two of his most famous works here. So there are so many Manet paintings at the Met. You can do a program just on him because they have such a large collection. So I thought that's what we do today, learn about the life and career of Manet. These are some of the paintings we're going to be looking at. These aren't all the paintings of Manet's that they have at the Met, but these are probably like, say, the top six most well-known or most uh, noteworthy or influential ones. So we're going to look at these six plus several others. And then in addition to that, I thought what we would do is while we're at it, why don't we talk about the paintings at the Met by Mo Manet and compare and contrast him with some of his other well-known works. So these are, say, perhaps the most famous Manet paintings that are at museums, not called the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, but we'll talk about these and a few others as well and kind of see how do these works that aren't at the Met relate to the ones that are at the Met. And I thought while we're at it, because they have such a fabulous art collection in New York, why not, while we're at it, uh, talk about some of the other Impressionist paintings that are there as well. So Monet, Renoir, Cassatt, Van Gogh, 
Degas, Cezanne, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we'll talk about some other Impressionist painters as well. But our focus today is Edouard Manet. So let's go ahead and begin. Let's talk about Manet's early life. I thought what I would do is go through and discuss his life mostly in a chronological order. So let's talk about the early days. Manet was born in Paris. And if you look at this map, the blue arrow is pointing to his birthplace. And look, he was born right across the river from the Louvre. That's pretty cool. And then if you look over to the left side of the map, there's a red arrow that's pointing to the cemetery where Manet is buried. So uh, that's right across the river from the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> so Manet born not too far from the Louvre, buried not too far from the Eiffel Tower. So how cool is that? This is Manet's birth place over here on the right, this opening here. This is a large apartment complex today. Here is the address if you want to go check it out next time you're in Paris. It's not open to the public, but it is a kind of a noteworthy tourist attraction. Regardless, they have the historical marker out on the side indicating that this was the birthplace of Manet. And here's the inside photo. So imagine this, someone is living inside the house that Manet was born in. That's really cool. Um, unfortunately, again, not open to the public, but it is note that, nice that they've designated it as a historical landmark. Here is a early painting by Manet of his parents, father on the left, mother on the right. And a picture of Manet as a young man. He came from a wealthy family. He had the advantage that some of the Impressionists didn't have in that his family was somewhat supportive of his art career, both um, kind of say on a financial basis and then also to just being um, supportive in general. Uh, many of the Impressionists struggled financially um, because either they did not come from uh, parents that were wealthy or because their family did not support the career decision that they had made. But Manny was not in that situation. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the early works that he made. So I thought what I would do is break the paintings of his down into kind of categories. So these are some early works by Manet. This is actually a landscape painting that's Manet and his girlfriend over here on the right. They're dressed in period Rubenesque type clothing. This is called Fishing from around 1862 or 1863. If you're from the United States, joining us from there, just to give you a historical context, the American Civil War was fought between 1861 and 1865. So a Civil War era painting, not that that has anything to do with this particular work, but just to give you that historical context. And again, that's Manet and his girlfriend in the bottom right corner. And they're dressed in period clothing uh, that's familiar to people that like the paintings by Rubens because Manet was a big fan of Rubens. And so this painting is kind of a homage to him. There they are. Here is a close up. So that's not their typical Paris attire of the day. Now, 1862, 1863 is a big one and a half year span for Manet because he really kind of bursts onto the Parisian and French art scene with these two paintings on the right. So let's go ahead and talk about these. At the time that he painted these, he was 30 to 31 years old. And up until this point in time, he had been making paintings for quite a few years, but he hadn't really gotten a lot of success. He um, starts out uh, doing various academic endeavors. He had tried to join the Navy um, and he does start painting, but he doesn't really have a lot of success. He's kind of experimenting, takes him a while. And then he paints these two works, which really kind of just overnight made him really well known. Now they didn't make him say um, popular because these paintings were not highly regarded at the time, but they made him very controversial, partially because of the nudity that were involved. So this one is called Luncheon on the Grass from 1862. This is one of his most famous paintings. It's not at the Met. 
But you can see there is a nude woman uh, having like a picnic type lunch with these two fully dressed guys. And then in the background, there's another woman who's partially dressed. And so just people were very shocked by this nudity that was in this painting in this very unusual scene. And then he followed up with this painting, Olympia in 1863. And again, people shocked by the nudity. Um, the woman in this painting is depicted as a prostitute uh, just because of her pose and some of the accessories that she has on her and the black cat and the flowers and whatnot. And people had been used to seeing nudity in paintings, but they were used to seeing idealized women, uh, meaning women that weren't actually real, kind of like, uh, uh, like the Statue of Liberty is like an idealization of a woman. It's not actually a real person, the Statue of Liberty. Um, same thing with these two paintings. These are real people uh, that he's depicting and that was very shocking for people. So he gets a lot of kind of notoriety and attention, um, not a lot of it good, at least not at this point in time in his career. So anyway, 1862, 1863, really big turning point for Manet. He's gonna just burst onto the art scene with these two works. He made a few religious type works with kind of Christian themes. Here is a good example of that. This is the dead Christ with angels. Kind of an unusual painting for Manet. One of the challenges with talking about Manet is because he tries to do a lot of different types of things. It's not like he's um, consistently doing the same style or the same subject matter um, throughout his career. So you'll see that in our presentation, it kind of twists and turns as he tries different things and experiments with different things. This is his attempt at kind of the Christian history painting genre, which was popular at that point in time. This is the biblical story from John 2012, where Mary Magdalene entered the tomb of Christ and she sees two angels, but finds Jesus body missing. But for this painting, he's included Jesus. So they're getting ready to carry him off. How many Impressionist painters did depictions of Civil War battles? Hmm, uh, not very many, but, but Manet did. He was really interested in current affairs. And you may be surprised to know that the American Civil War was big news throughout different parts of the world, including France. And this was a battle scene that took place that Manet created in his painting. This was, let me go back. This was a battle between the Union ship Kearsarge off the French coast and the Confederate ship Alabama. And again, with the Civil War in the United States, people tend to kind of think of just about the armies and Gettysburg and stuff like that. But there were a lot of naval activities, engagements that took place, including far away from the United States. So this is actually a naval battle between this Confederate ship on the right and the Union ship on the left. This is a historical print from the era. Uh, the Union ship is pictured here in the foreground, has these big cannons, and it basically blows the Confederate ship out of the water. The ship ended up, the Confederate ship ends up sinking. What's happening here? And the crew get off onto these lifeboats, some of whom were captured by the Union. Some of the crew actually escaped to kind of neutral ships um, <laughs> and were able to get away. And again, this was big news throughout the world. So you can see over on the left, these are newspaper accounts of this battle. And then over on the right, these are French newspaper accounts. So kind of interesting that this Civil War naval battle, which is fought off the coast of France, was really big news over there. And so Manet, who was really interested in kind of current affairs, he decides that he's going to do a painting or two of this battle. And so that's actually what he ends up doing. So this is, again, the name of the ship is called the Kearsarge. And it was a battle that was fought off the coast of France in a place called Boulogne. Now, Manet ends up actually making two paintings of the same battle. This is another one for our friends in Philadelphia. It's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So here is the one at the Met. And here's the one at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And here's the two side by side. So the Confederate ship sunk 
And so Manane actually did not see the battle, but what happened was the Union ship then sailed into a French port and docked. And Manet went to visit it. He spent a lot of time reading newspaper accounts of the battle. And so that's how he has ended up to create these two scenes. So this isn't an exact depiction from a first person point of view because he wasn't there, but he did see the Union Victoria ship up close when it docked. And he read numerous accounts of the battle and recreated the scene here. So too, again, you wouldn't think, you don't necessarily associate um, impressionist painters with um, American Civil War battle scenes, but you do in this instance. And again, the Confederate ship, the Alabama, which is on the right, was sunk by Union cannon fire and thus defeated. Okay, let's continue on. We'll talk about this next painting on the right, woman here in pink. These are pictures I took at the Met a couple months ago. And I put a star by this one because this is a really important painting. So there's a handful of paintings that we'll look at today that are at the Met by Manet. And I put stars by them. So you can like, okay, yeah, this is an important one. This is called Young Lady from 1866. So about two years after he painted the Civil War scenes. And this is the painting on the left, a pre-Impressionist painting. So Manet is considered an Impressionist artist and many of the works that he did were in the Impressionist style and time frame. But this painting on the left is before Impressionism. And one of the things that's noteworthy about Manet, in addition to the fact that he makes really cool looking paintings, is he's a really important figure in the history of art because he bridges traditional or pre-Impressionism and Impressionism. And you get a sense for that here. The painting on the left, not Impressionism, it's before uh, that takes place, but the painting on the right, which we'll discuss later, is Impressionistic. And Manet, you wonder, these artists, where do they get their ideas from or who are they influenced by? Well, for oftentimes they're uh, influenced and inspired by artists that came before them. Manet in particular was really interested in Spanish art. In fact, he took trips to Spain to actually uh, study the artwork by these artists up close and in person at different places, including the Prado. And so if you look at this painting made by Manet in 1866 on the right, that's at the Met with these other two well-known paintings that are at the Met that are by Spanish artists, you can see, wow, yeah, they look kind of similar. So let me go back this one from 1650. This one from 1820, Goya. And the three side by side. So again, these are all three paintings at the Met, but by three different artists and about 200 plus years separating the first one and the last one. But you can see the similarities. So you can see when he goes to Spain, looks at these paintings and says, oh, I really like those a lot. And then comes back home to Paris that really impacts his style. And again, this is pre-Impressionism we're talking about. Impressionism doesn't really come around until the early to mid uh, 1870s. So this is quite a few years before that. And if you compare the painting on the left, which is at the Met, which this other one, which is in the Impressionist style, you can really notice quite a few differences. This one's a very dark background. This one is all the colors going on and a few other things. So just want to point out that not all paintings by Manet are considered Impressionistic. And guess what? This is actually the same woman in both paintings. So if you've seen this one on the right, which is actually at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, one of our hometown museums, uh, one of their most well-known works, this one's at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC on the right. This one's at the Met, it's the same woman. That's pretty cool. We'll talk more about her in just a minute. This painting is called The Railway, one of the most famous Manet paintings. Back to the one in New York. Um, this one, there's a lot going on. So this is a piece of fruit down here at the bottom. There's a bird over on the right. She's doing something with her hands. Um, so let's talk about that in just a second. Also, the woman in the painting on the right is the same one that was featured in Olympia in Luncheon on the Grass. So same person featured in all of these paintings. Let's 
So that's what's kind of funny about art. Um, you're probably familiar with some of these paintings. You've probably seen them before, but you might not have realized that it's the same person that's being depicted in all the paintings. And here she is, Edouard Manet's favorite model. Her name was Victorine Moron. And she was Edward Manet's favorite model. And he ends up depicting her in numerous paintings. These are kind of maybe the five of the most famous ones. And again, really interesting that it's the same person being depicted over and over again. Here's a photo of her on the left. Now, one of the things that's interesting about, they say, compare and contrast, say, films with paintings is how come in movies, we know the name of the actress, but we don't necessarily know the name of the director. So like, here's three examples of films that are popular. And I'm guessing that you probably know the name of maybe one or two or even three of these actresses. But how many of the film directors of these do you know? Um, maybe one or two if you're a real film buff, but for the average person probably don't know the director of any of these films. But with paintings, it's the exact opposite. We know the name of the artist, but not the model. And so I don't know why that is. It's kind of more of a rhetorical question. <laughs> maybe if you know, you can let us know in the chat or the Q&A. But again, interesting, if you look at these paintings, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's man A. But who is in the painting? I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> but when you talk about movies, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know who these actresses are. Well, who is the director of the movies? Oh, I don't know. Um, so just really kind of an interesting kind of contrast between, say, films and paintings. And again, she's Edward Manet's favorite model. Now, she has a sad story. She actually, um, at later on decides that she doesn't want to be a model anymore. And she ends up pursuing an art career herself. Later on, she was a teacher. And then she kind of, um, like many women that are involved in impressionism or just art in general, she ends up kind of um, suffering hard times financially. And so when Manet dies, Victorine actually goes to see Manet's wife, Suzanne. We'll talk more about Suzanne a little bit later. And what she tells Suzanne is, um, listen, when I posed for Manet, he didn't really have any money, so he paid me, but not all that much, but he told me that if he ever made it big, or if I ever needed money to come and see him, and he'd kind of help me out, um, and so that's kind of what happened. I posed for him. In fact, some of the ponies I posed in the nude, um, your husband <laughs> ended up becoming a big rock star painter, made a lot of money. Um, I'm broke. Uh, you know, can you help me out anyway? Uh, and Suzanne Manet basically brushed her aside and said, we owe you nothing and sent her on her way. And it's a really sad story. A lot of the women of Impressionism that kind of played uh, important roles really kind of got discarded and kind of cast off. And the, the artists that they ended up posing for end up becoming very popular and successful and wealthy. Um, but the women um, oftentimes not so much. A really kind of a sad story for women like Victorine, who are so popular because they've been featured in these paintings, but yet we don't know who they are and they struggled in life financially uh, later on in the future. Here is another perspective of her. Here's a close up. This is another interesting painting because Manet is trying to capture the five senses. So down at the bottom, it might be hard to see, but there's an orange there, an orange that's partially peeled. That represents taste. There's a parakeet that represents hearing. Uh, and then as far as sight goes, she's holding a, what's called a monocle lens. That's one of those um, eyeglasses that only goes over one eye. And then as far as touch and smell, she's holding and smelling a violet bouquet. So how about that? Manny's got all five senses covered in the young lady. It's also an interesting painting that she's fully dressed because he had gotten so much controversy for luncheon in the grass in Olympia. Some people have theorized that perhaps this was his response. Like, oh, okay, you didn't like it when I showed her in the nude. I'll show her completely dressed. And the only thing you'll be able to see is her hands and her face um, and maybe a little bit of her toe sticking out here at the bottom. So some people kind of thought this was a, um, you know, uh, response to the negative criticism he had received for some of the early paintings of her. And again, these are Manet's early works. Let's continue on. Talk about still lifes. 
Manet was a big fan of painting still lifes. And if you're not exactly sure the definition of this, still life is a popular art subject depicting mostly inanimate subject matter, typically commonplace objects, either natural or man-made, such as flowers, food, plants, drinking glasses, dishes, vases, etc. cetera. Um, still life is a popular art form for artists to partake in. It lets them, gives them a chance to kind of test out their skills or depict different things. It's throughout history, it's been kind of had a like an up and down uh, popularity though, depending on the artist and what it is they're depicting. Here are three still lifes that Manet did that are at the Met. Still life with flowers, fan and pearls from 1860. It's a close up. These peonies. These were Manet's favorite flower and he actually grew them in the, his own garden. So they think that maybe he just went out and picked some flowers and, and then went ahead and painted them. No need to go to the store if you grow your own flowers. And these have some elements of Impressionism, but this is again about maybe eight or 10 years before Impressionism comes along, although it does have kind of some Impressionistic um, aspects to these works. Now, Manet, of course, not the only person to paint still lifes. Um, he, again, he does like this form. These works are not really his most well-known ones. They, they're not unknown, um, but they're not his most, say, popular or his most, say, um, influential or noteworthy. Uh, if you want to talk about someone who kind of cornered the market on uh, popularizing still lifes, you have to think about Vincent van Gogh um, and look at compare and contrast these two paintings that are at the Met, um, Manet's Peonies from 1864-1865 and then quite a few years later uh, van Gogh comes along and he does his irises in 1890. So I wanted to show you this slide so you can get a sense of van Gogh. His career was taking place long after Manet's. In fact if you go back to this slide notice that Manet passed away in 1883 And this is done in 1890. Most of the work that Van Gogh did was after Manet died. So they kind of are lumped into the same category as Impressionists, but a little bit different time frame. They have quite a few other Van Goghs at the Met, including sunflowers, irises, and another version of irises. So even though we're talking about Manet, wanted you to see some of the other great Impressionist paintings they have at the Met so you know what to expect when you make your next or first visit there. Okay, let's talk about Spanish influence. So again, before we were talking about how Manet traveled to Spain and was greatly influenced by Spanish artists, he was just really fascinated by Spanish history and culture. And you see that in a number of paintings, particularly um, the years following his visit to Spain. This is called the Spanish guitar player or the Spanish singer. It's also one of his important works. You'll notice that it looks kind of similar to the young lady we saw earlier. It's got this very kind of dark monochromatic background. Now I do have some bad news for you. The guy in this painting is not really Spanish. And the painting was not painted in Spain. <laughs> what Manet had was he had a studio and he had a number of props in his studio, different things that he had collected um, during his travels and over time. So this was like clothing that he had and little props. And so uh, this person is probably not Spanish. They're probably French. And he probably painted this in his studio in Paris, but he's trying to make it look like um, a Spanish singer in Spain. So, you know, no harm with that. Uh, people of the era probably wouldn't have known that or perhaps wouldn't have cared. You know, it's kind of just like a Hollywood film. They don't necessarily film it 
where it's set. They might do it in a studio, same thing for painters. And here's a close up. I'm not a guitar player, but people that do play the guitar have said that they can tell just by the way his hands are that he's not a guitar player. I don't know exactly all the details Max. I don't play the guitar, but for you musicians out there, perhaps you know what they're talking about, but a nice painting nonetheless. And it's pretty cool at the Met because they have all these Spanish paintings all lined up in a group. So again, here's what I was talking about before. They have so many Manet paintings at the Met. I mean, there's some museums, some really good museums throughout the United States or even the world that don't have three Manet paintings in total. And the Met not only has three, they have three of the same style from like around the same time frame. Kind of shows you how uh, amazing their collection is, how large it is just to have three great paintings. Actually, four if you count the other one that we're um, going to look at in a second. And they're all in the same spot from the same time frame. This is actually the same woman we saw earlier. It just so happens that in this particular painting, she's dressed up in kind of more of like a boyish or a mannish type figure for whatever reason. That's our famous model, Victorine. So again, he goes to Spain, kind of absorbs the art and the history and the culture, and then comes back to Paris and ends up making these works. He brought a lot of things with him. And of course, Spain being right next door to France, um, if there was any extra things he needed, it'd be easy to go acquire them. This is probably the most well-known one of the group. This is a famous bullfighter, a matador. And check out the cool sideburns on this guy. It's really interesting looking at these paintings from back in the day and see the fashion and the hairstyles and the clothes and all that kind of stuff. So that's evident here. This is a matador from 1866, 1867. And it's not just any matador, it's actually one of the most famous matadors in Spanish history. He was kind of like the... Um, Oh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example. He was kind of like the LeBron James of Matadors, I guess, or the Beckman of <laughs> Bend it like Beckman of Matadors at that day. And so Manet actually depicted him in more than one painting. He did this one, but he did a few others as well. And just to give you a sense of the size of the painting, these are pretty big works. So if you another thing about Manet is if you look at his work, the paintings, um, they're usually not gigantic, but they're usually larger than other. Uh, say, impressionist artists of his era. Again, reason being is he's a little bit wealthier and better off financially. So if you were a starving artist back at this point in time, this would cost quite a bit of money to buy a canvas this size and the paint uh, that would require to cover it. And this is just one painting. Remember, he did all the other ones um, as well. And so finances aren't as a concern for Manet is some of his other contemporaries. If you look at, say, paintings by Monet, I don't have a comparison, but Monet's paintings from early on in his career, um, very few of them um, are this large because Monet himself, early on in his career, was actually a starving artist. And again, just a really neat work capturing the Spanish culture of bullfighting. And again, check out this really cool facial hair. You don't see that too often anymore. If you're looking for some fashion or style ideas. Again, the Spanish influence. So again, pretty amazing to have four paintings by Manet all of the same period in their collection. Um, here are just some other examples. This is from Chicago for our friends in the Midwest. This is the same bullfighter. This is a famous painting by Manet. So again, I just wanted to include some other well-known works or perhaps works you might have seen uh, in visits to your local museums or in your travels. So you can kind of see how these relate to some of the other things that have taken place. So that kind of all fits together. For our friends in Boston, this is the well-known painting at the Museum of Fine Arts. And you can see the title, Spanish Singer, and he's capturing the music again. Let's talk about some of Manet's avant-garde friends. Avant-garde means people that are kind of like on the cutting edge. Here are four paintings we'll look at from that period. And Manet was a little older than some of his other Impressionists, and he kind of served as like as a mentor figure. And also too, because he was, um, had financial support from his family, 
um, it allowed him to kind of, it kind of gave him more freedom to do what he wanted to do artistically. So this is an interesting painting. It's not by Manet, it's by one of his friends, but it shows him uh, kind of showing <laughs> how he paints with other artists of the era. So here's Renoir, one of his friends, and Frederick Bazile, pretty well known in Precious Art. And then look over here in the back, you have Monet. Um, so these are friends of Manet's and he really influences these artists and they end up influencing him. So, I mean, think about it. If you're Renoir and Monet and Basile and you're just getting started, you think having a session where you're sitting down, uh, listening to, talking to and watching Manet paint would be beneficial. Well, yeah, of course it would. Um, and so that's one of the characteristics of Impressionism. A lot of these artists kind of intermingled with one another and learned from one another. Here is the painting on the wall. And this is actually a painting of Monet working in his garden, his wife and his oldest son. Here's the full view. Here's our white star indicating this is an important one again. Oh, <laughs> Patty wanted to point out that the um, matador, the sideburns were called mutton chops. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Patty. I forgot to include that. Appreciate that. Again, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, opinions, ideas, perspectives, memories, et cetera, et cetera, feel free to type those in the Zoom chat or the Q&A. And this painting is from 1874. So this is really when Impressionism is starting to get going. 1873, 1874. This is the Monet family in their garden at Argentoy. Argentoy, a suburb northwest of Paris. The Monets were renting a house there. And interestingly enough, Manet was initially really bothered by Monet because what happened was Manet, with an A, was the more established artist. And then Monet with the O came along and people started confusing the two of them, which didn't really bother Monet all that much because he's the new kid on the block. But for Manet, who was the more established artist, the guy that you know 12 years earlier had painted Olympia and Luncheon on the Grass and people, most everyone in uh, the French art world knew who he was, they he was really annoyed with getting comparisons to this Monet guy or people getting him mixed up with Monet. And he used to have to always tell people, listen, I'm not Monet with an O, I'm Manet with an A. So initially he was really kind of annoyed by Claude Monet. But then what ends up happening is he meets Monet and Monet was a pretty friendly guy. And the two of them actually got along really well. So it kind of uh, smooth things up or patch things over. So kind of funny that Manet initially was kind of perturbed by Monet. Um, I wanted to give you some idea of when people talk like, what exactly is Impressionism? People frequently ask that when I give um, in-person tours. And there's a lot of different characteristics of Impressionism. The, if you wanted to make an all-inclusive list, there would be many more things than there are here. And it also kind of depends too on what artists you're talking about. So like for instance, Degas, one of the things that he's well known for is his kind of cropping um, of works where you don't really see that in Manet, but some of the things that are kind of characteristic of Monet's work that's related to impressionism that we're gonna see today are bright colors, uh, number one. Number two is kind of the abstract. Notice this doesn't list like a photographic depiction um, of these people. And then also the visible brush strokes. We'll talk about that in a little bit. He's depicting modern Paris life. And then he's typically sometimes painting outdoors and a few other things. So here is the full view of the work. And you can actually see the brush strokes in this painting. So like, look here, look over here. And you know, that may not seem like that big of a deal, now, but that was really unusual at the time. Painters before this did not do that. What you were supposed to do in this time frame was kind of smooth these out so you couldn't see the individual brush strokes. Again, also to notice the bright, vivid colors. We didn't see that in the previous mayonnaise. Remember, there were the very dark backgrounds. Um, also, too, it's slightly abstract. I mean, we can tell what this is. It's a guy and a woman and a young child, um, but it's definitely not photographic uh, in terms of the detail. So abstract in that regard. This is also painted outdoors. That was something that the Impressionists like to do. So again, if you're kind of talking about Manet and Impressionism, what does he bring to the party? It's bright colors. We see that, check. Abstraction, okay, we see that, check. Uh, visible brush strokes, check. Uh, modern Paris life, 
you really don't see paintings. We'll talk more about the subjects a little bit later. You really don't see kind of people just hanging out in their garden um, in paintings before Impressionism is often. And then they're, of course, painted outdoors. And you can see the contrast of these works, which we've already looked at, these four in the top, which are pre-Impressionism, with these two that are Impressionism. Again, remember, think back to the bullets that I just showed a minute ago, the bright colors and the abstraction, and you can see the brush strokes, um, and et cetera, et cetera. So Monet, Manet, really interesting figure in that he bridges traditional art or traditional painting and the modern Impressionist style. So these four paintings on the top are pre-Impressionism, and these two on the bottom are Impressionism. And so if you're kind of thinking, well, what exactly is Impressionism? Well, here it is. Just look at this slide, kind of look at for the comparisons and contrast between these six works, and you can see the differences. So again, this is his buddy, Claude Monet, working out in his garden. This is Claude Monet's wife and their oldest son. Manet came over for a visit. He didn't live very far away. And of course, Monet is a friend of his. You contrast the Monet figure in this painting with the Spanish singer we saw a decade earlier. And again, wow, yeah, that's quite a bit of difference. You would maybe look at this and not think that this is the same artist, <laughs> or if it was the same artist, there was quite a time gap between these two, which it is a fair amount. Uh, this is in the 1860s, this is in the 1870s, but very, very different uh, in terms of the depiction of these two male figures. And the same thing with the women. So here's the 1870s version of a woman, here's the 1860s, and they look very different. I mean, it's not the same woman, but just the style of the paintings are very, very different. Again, you could easily look at this and think that, gee, that must be two different artists because they don't look the same style at all. Oftentimes you can look at paintings and uh, recognize, if you are familiar with the artwork of a particular artist, sometimes you can see a work that they did that maybe you aren't familiar with, but you can immediately recognize that, oh yeah, that's Frida Kahlo, or that's Georgia O'Keeffe, or that's Vincent van Gogh. Um, if you had been familiar with Manet, you might not recognize uh, these two being by the same artist. So again, you have to think that Manet being buddies with Monet uh, is definitely going to have a positive impact. I mean, if you think about it yourself. If you were an artist and Monet was one of your buddies, you think being around him and learning about art from his uh, perspective and idea would help you? Yeah, of course. And then vice versa, same thing with Monet, um, getting the benefit of hanging out with his older friend and more established artist, Edouard Manet. Do they have Monet paintings at the Met? Well, of course they do. Here's a couple examples. Um, Monet, of course, would go on to great things himself. This is one of his classic examples is at the Met. Bridge over a pond of water lilies from 1899. And here's another example, water lilies from 1919. Monet really outlived Manet. Um, Manet died in 1883. Monet died in 1926. This is a painting, if you were just kind of look at this like, oh, okay, it's the funeral, he's depicting some dead guy getting buried. Um, but the story with this one is, is this is actually a close friend of his. So Manet was friends with a writer by the name Charles Baudelaire, and he is probably more popular in Europe than he is here in America, but he's a very um, influential and well-known writer, Charles Baudelaire, and he was someone that Manet was friends with, and so he hangs out with him uh, when he ended up dying suddenly in 1867. Manet does a painting of his funeral. And I bring this up to say, if you think about like the history of art, how many people that are say painters 
um, are really good friends with people that are also famous writers. I mean, it kind of shows you, I'm giving you these kind of um, uh, friendly connections. You can kind of get a sense of uh, Manet's hanging around a lot of avant-garde, uh, well-known kind of thought leader type people. They obviously influenced his painting style and he obviously influenced them as well. This is another famous writer that was friends with Manet by the name of George Moore. You have heard of him. And he did two works of him that are at the Met. So George Moore, famous writer and kind of art critic slash historian. He's also buddies with Manet. And there used to be back in the day, a really popular cafe. So here's our map of Paris again, just to orient yourself. Here's the Louvre, you walk north of the Louvre over here. And what's the importance of that? This is the building today. It doesn't really look like anything special. It's just a store. Um, this is a street corner. But back in the day of Impressionism, this was a really important spot because it was a cafe that a lot of artists and writers and the avant-garde uh, people would hang out at and uh, talk about politics and you know all different types of things. So this was a really, really important spot during the time of Impressionism. It's unfortunate quite a few years ago, the building burned down and they replaced it with something that kind of sort of looks similar to the original. Uh, this is the site in more recent times. This is what it looked like back in the day, but this is a really uh, popular hangout for intellectuals of Paris in the era. You might be familiar with the cafe culture of Paris. And in fact, one of Manet's most famous paintings, this one's at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., is Plum Brandy. And this painting was painted at this cafe. So this famous cafe in Paris is where Manet paints this work, Plum Brandy, which is at the National Gallery of Art, one of his most famous paintings. In fact, it's just one of the most famous Impressionist paintings in general. But guess what the connection is to the Met? Well, it's the same cafe where he would hang out with his buddy, George Moore, the writer, and you can see the similarities between these two. So this painting on the right is not uh, really all that well known, even though the artist, the writer himself is well known. Um, but you can see this one at the National Gallery of Art, 1877. This one at the Met, 1878. Look at the poses, even though it's a woman and a man, um, they're both depicted in the same cafe, but he has them in almost the same exact pose, or at least very similar uh, with them kind of slouched over to the right. Uh, they have their right arm up here, left one's on the table. She's got the drink over here. She's got the plum brandy over here. She's smoking a cigarette. And they both have hats on and kind of looking the same direction. So again, kind of interesting. Uh, when you look at this painting, like, oh, that looks really similar to the plum at the National Gallery of Art. So that's why it's really helpful if you're studying art to kind of compare and contrast it with other things, um, just because there are so many um, six degrees of connection and again, that's his buddy, the writer, George Moore. Here is another painting he did by the same, for the same figure. Manet was also good friends with Emile Zola, another famous writer. So again, kind of the takeaway for this section is Manet is not just operating in a vacuum by himself. He's hanging out with Monet and Renoir and these well-known writers and, you know, talking to them about art and philosophy and religion and politics and all that kind of stuff. And these writers, to a certain degree, are doing the same thing that Monet, Manet, and the other Impressionists are doing. They're changing uh, what's going to be popular in literature and changing styles and things like that. Let's talk about modern Parisian life. And when I say modern, I mean modern back in the days of Impressionism, not modern in, say, 2021. And Manet frequently would capture kind of uh, images of people participating in modern Parisian life. So before, say, the mid 1800s, there wasn't really a big middle class. And so people say from the 
uh, days before Impressionism, they didn't really have a lot of free time or leisure time to go do things like hang out in their garden and go boating and eat in cafes and, you know, stuff like that. People were just busy working all day trying to keep their head above water, so to speak, financially. But in the, say, in the mid 1800s, you really have an expansion of the middle class and people now have more um, disposable income and they have more free time so they can do things like plant gardens and spend weekends out enjoying themselves or they can go out on dates that are boating on the river and stuff like that and so the impressionists are capturing this what would be considered very modern type of leisure activities uh, at the time now in modern times it would not seem like that big of a deal for someone to be gardening or going boating but for people of say the decades before Impressionism, um, this would have been a very unusual kind of lifestyle because only the wealthy would have done this in the era before the growth of the middle class. And in fact, some other well-known man-made paintings also capture this modern Parisian lifestyle. Here's a woman, we were talking before about the cafes. This woman at the Art Institute of Chicago, she's hanging out reading in a cafe while she has a nice beverage here. So another classic example of Manet capturing the modern Paris life. This would have been something new in that, that era. Um, before the mid to late 1800s, women in Paris did not go out by themselves to places like cafes. They would only do that if they had a chaperone, but by all essence or appearances, this woman is here by herself. This is another famous Manet painting, the bar at the Follies right here. And again, another activity that people, the growing middle class are participating in because they have leisure time, they have disposable income, they can go to places like this and enjoy themselves when they're not working. And again, it may be easy to say, oh, okay, well, what was the big deal with that? Well, the big deal was people didn't do that before. So here's another famous painting from the Met by a different artist, David. And this is the death of Socrates from 1787, one of their most famous paintings. So this is obviously before Impressionism. And here's a battle scene from 1860s, 1870s. So the reason why I'm showing you these works is this is the type of stuff that people would make before Impressionism. So you wouldn't do paintings of people hanging out in their gardens or going boating or sitting in cafes, kind of the preferred or the uh, approved subject matter was what they called history paintings, where you're depicting either scenes from the Bible or scenes from Greek and Roman mythology or scenes of like historical events that took place, like great battles. Um, and so this is kind of the preferred subject matter for artists that were making paintings before Impressionism. Now the Impressionists come along and they're like, well, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> we just wanted to pick kind of what's going on now. And in, in a certain way, the Impressionists are really kind of like uh, journalists. They're kind of like documenting uh, what's taking place in this kind of modern Paris where you have, here's a painting by Renoir at the Met. And he's got two young girls at the piano. And again, before Impressionism, the only girls that would have been getting piano lessons would have been the very wealthy, but because of changes in economics and society and all that kind of stuff, you have this growing middle class. It would not be uncommon, particularly for upper middle class girls to get something like piano lessons. And thus, that's why the Impressionists want to capture these types of things. Dance classes by Degas, the subject of our next program next month. Another painting by Degas. So again, you're not seeing, seeing this historical paintings from scenes from the Bible or Greek and Roman mythology or these battles. You're seeing like actual people living their lives in modern Paris. Mary Cassatt, young woman drinking a cup of tea. And you see these types of scenes over and over and over in Impressionism. Probably the two most common subject matters in Impressionism are landscapes or these kind of modern city lifestyle type works. And you frequently see that with Manet as well. Here is his big painting. This is boating from 1874. Here it is on the wall, got a pretty cool frame. And again, 
artists before that would have done these historical subjects, um, but that's not what the Impressionists want to do. They don't care about that stuff. <laughs> they they, they want to show what's going on now uh, in the real world. Here's the full view of the work. And again, voting from 1874, one of Manet's most famous paintings. It's one of the most famous paintings at the Met. It's one of the most famous paintings in Impressionism. And again, we were talking before about what does kind of Manet bring to the party uh, in terms of his impact on impressions. Well, you have the bright colors, okay, check. Uh, abstraction, it's not super abstract, but yet on the other hand, it's not like an exact photographic image. Um, you can see the brush strokes. It may be a little bit difficult to see until we get more of the full view. Um, modern Paris life, yeah, you have people hanging outside boating, and he would have obviously painted this outdoor because the people are out on the water. So really kind of classic example of some of the things to look for in terms of Impressionism. And again, there's other characteristics of Impressionist painting, but as far as Manet goes, these are the kind of ones that he's most familiar with. There's, if you had to make a list of Van Gogh in Impressionism, uh, some of these things would be included, but yet some things would be different. Same thing for Monet or Degas, Renoir, et cetera, et cetera. And why are they painting all this stuff from what's going on? Well, here's a great quote by Manet. You must be of your time and paint what you see. So they don't see scenes from the Bible. They don't see scenes from Greek and Roman religion. They don't see these battles that took place um, years earlier. They're living in this kind of current world or modern contemporary Paris world. And so that's what they're end up deciding to paint. Here's the full view. If you look closely, you can see some of the brush strokes on here. Talking about that. And again, just these really beautiful colors. Want someone kind of relaxing while the guy's guiding the boat. And so I've set this up so you can kind of digest this or process this. So today, uh, I think one of the reasons why people like Impressionism is because just the paintings are really beautiful and they're really fascinating and interesting. And if you were to look at this painting on the wall, you could just say, hey, I like it just because of the way it looks, which that's totally fine. However, it's really important to understand the change that was taking place in art in this time. So not only are Impressionist paintings very beautiful and fascinating to look at, they're also really influential because what happens is artists that come after Impressionists like Matisse and Picasso and Georgia O'Keeffe and Jackson Pollock and Frida Kahlo, um, they kind of take cues from Impressionism that they, hey, we don't have to do these certain subject matters and we don't have to do these certain styles and we don't have to follow all these other rules. We can kind of do whatever we want. So really uh, Impressionism is, is the beginning of modern art. And it's really important to kind of uh, leave today with that understanding of how different uh, these paintings were than the work that had been done before them. Here's another good example. Here's another painting by David from 1788. This is at the Met. So uh, here's a couple, young couple, uh, 1788, famous painting by a famous artist at the Met. And compare and contrast it with the Manet. So you have a woman on the left, guy on the right, they're kind of closely intertwined, but quite a few differences. Notice the colors on this, much brighter and vivider. This is outdoors. Um, this doesn't look like a photograph, but it's pretty realistic. Uh, this is an indoor scene, it's an outdoor scene. Um, not sure what they're doing. He's got some paper, so I'm assuming he's doing something kind of like business related. Um, these people are out boating. Uh, so again, really easy to see the differences, uh, Impressionism with artwork that came before it when you line them up side by side. When we go do our tours at the museum in person, I always make sure we go look at some artwork that was made before Impressionism, because again, it's really kind of easy to fall into that trap of just looking at the artwork and saying, oh, I like it, you know, it's really nice, which that's fine. But if you want kind of a deeper understanding, you really have to uh, recognize just the, how change uh, took place and how different these paintings were than what became before. Someone from the 1700s, uh, or even the 1600s, a, a century before this painting was made, someone could have come and look at this and recognized the style and said, oh, okay, I mean, yeah, there would have been some nuances that would have been different over time, but for the longest time, the goal was just to make things look as realistic as possible. Um, and that had been going on for centuries. And then all of a sudden, 
oh, wow, this is something completely different. We're going to go try uh, all these different things in terms of color and subject matter and perspective and technique, et cetera, et cetera. And all these changes with Impressionism all end up taking place around the same time. So again, today it's easy to see the aesthetic beauty in Impressionist paintings. However, also understand the change that occurred and really this is the beginning of modern art. Manet painted a similar view to the museum in France. It's the same male figure. He's with a different woman though, so not sure what happened to her, but she's been replaced by her. Same guy though, and same artist. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Manet's family. This is his wife, Suzanne. I mentioned her briefly. Uh, she's also a very interesting person. I thought at some point in time, it'd be really fascinating to do a program about the women, uh, kind of behind the scenes in Impressionism, the wives, the girlfriends, uh, the mothers, the daughters, the models, the patrons, et cetera, et cetera. A uh, lot, really a lot of fascinating women in the world of Impressionism, but today we're just gonna focus on Manet. So this is his wife, Suzanne, and how she met Manet is Manet's father hired her to teach his son's piano lessons in 1851, and things kind of progressed from there. She had a son in 1852, so the year after she started her piano lessons, and um, she the son was born out of wedlock, which that doesn't matter to me, um, but the reason why that's an important part of the story is that was really unusual for that era. There were not a lot of children that were born out of wedlock, and she never publicly um, confirmed who the father was. Some people think it was Manet. Some people think maybe it was his father. Some people think maybe it was some other people. Um, she had a secret relationship with Edouard Manet. They kept the relationship secret from his father. Um, they were actually living together <laughs> at one point in time, which again, in the mid 1800s, that would have been very unusual for a man and a woman who weren't married to be living together. Um, and historians aren't really quite sure why it was a big secret. So kind of one of the big uh, mysteries in Manet's life, but he does end up marrying her in 1863. She's kind of like the rock um, of his life. They were together for such a long time and she posed for many of his paintings. Here's a nice picture of her at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. That's her playing the piano. And interestingly enough, this would have been years after, remember she got hired in 1851 to teach the Manet boys piano lessons. Remember the Manet family was pretty wealthy, so they could afford to hire a private piano teacher. So a nice painting of her. And these are three works of Manet's family that are at the museum. So these two, the one on the left and the one in the center, Manet's wife, Suzanne, and then that's his either son and or stepson on the right. We'll talk about him in just a minute. Here is Madame Manet. This is a really interesting painting. This is one that you might kind of just glance at and say, oh, okay, you know, that's nice. The reason why this one's fascinating is because it's not finished. And so oftentimes with artists, we really only get to see the finished work. We don't see, get the chance to observe or get a peek into the artistic development process, but we do with this one. So because, and we're not, sure why he didn't finish this painting, but you can see what he's done here is he's making some lines and then eventually he's gonna fill in the color. So it's like he's made an outline and he starts filling in the colors, but he never quite finished the process. Um, sometimes artists, when they're creating a work, they will do this kind of prep work um, as kind of far as outlining the forms that they wanna make. And sometimes they don't. This one you can see, He's clearly done that. So kind of interesting, uh, unique perspective into a partially completed Manet painting. And it's a big mystery why he did not finish this one because he ended up making quite a few paintings of his wife. He just at some point in time set this one aside and then a few years later he died. Here is another work of his wife. This one is very impressionistic. You can see the bright colors. You can see it's pretty abstract. It's outdoors. She's sitting outside in a park. And again, let's do the compare and contrast thing. 
So here's a famous painting at the Met from 1851, 1853 kind of timeframe. So about 20 years before the start of Impressionism. And wow, look at those differences. So again, you have 1851 to 1853 here on the left, and then 1880. So these are two different artists, but look at how different those paintings are. So what is Impressionism? Well, it's the one on the right, of course. And again, you can just tell it's um, they're really, they both have bright colors. This one actually is unusual for the era, the fact that it does have colors, uh, so much color. In the foreground, the background is very kind of muted. Um, and then you contrast that with these really bright, vivid background colors. Uh, you can see the brush strokes. It's painted outdoors. It's abstract. I mean, this almost looks like a photograph uh, when you look at the one on the left. And again, for, for decades and centuries, artists, the goal was to make depictions of people and places and things look as realistic as possible. And you can see, wow, yeah, he really did that for that one. <laughs> it looks like a photograph. Whereas Manet, that's not what he's interested in. He wants to show color and light and various things like that. So again, bright colors, abstraction, visible brush strokes, modern Paris life, painting outdoors, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You can check those boxes off here. And I go back to this one. I'm not saying that one of these is better than the other. I actually really like both of these paintings. Um, so not saying that one like impressionism is better than the stuff that came before it, or vice versa. They're both just very different, and it's really helpful uh, to kind of process all this stuff and see the context of how these are both similar and different, but mostly different. Not sure why his wife's not smiling in this particular one, but people of that era tended to look a little more serious when they were posing for paintings and photos. Now, this is a painting from much, much earlier. Um, I kind of included this one out of order because we're talking about uh, Manet's family, but this one is from 1861. This is called Boy with a Sword. So we've, this is the one where we went out of order. And the only reason I'm including it here is because we're talking about Manet's family, but this is actually from back in the day. And you can tell that because it's the very dark background. Remember, it looks kind of like the woman um, with the pink dress that we saw earlier. And so this is the boy that Suzanne had, her son, who they weren't quite sure who the father was, which um, not a big deal, but Manet himself does not have any living descendants because we do not know of any biological children that Manet had, with the exception of this um, young boy, may potentially be his son or maybe the son of somebody else. But this boy, if he is or is not Manet's son, he did not have any children himself. So as far as we know, there are no living descendants um, of Edward Manet, unfortunately, but this is a really cool painting nonetheless, Boy with Sword from 1861. And again, you can see how stylistically it looks very similar to that painting we saw from early in his career. Let me go back, as opposed to say, contrast it with this one. So this was from 1880, that's his wife. This is 1861, his wife's son. And the side by side. So, is this impressionist? No. <laughs> um, are there bright colors? No. Is it abstract? No. Are there visible brush strokes? No. Is it a depiction of modern Paris life? No. And is it painted outdoors? No. So, this is not impressionism. So, again, kind of a key takeaway is Manet is oftentimes considered an impressionist artist, which he is, um, but he really bridges traditional painting and impressionism. So, just because you see a painting by Manet doesn't necessarily mean it's an impressionist painting and this one of his uh, son slash stepson is a really great example and kind of compare and contrast this boy with the Monet's child from 13 years earlier and so again you can see pre-impressionism impressionism and you can see quite a few differences so it's not the same boy this is Suzanne's son and this is Claude Monet's son uh, and there's a 13 year difference between the two paintings, but notice how different the depictions of the boys are. So again, if you go back to what Impressionism is, 
bright colors, abstraction, visible brush strokes, modern Paris life, painting outdoors, non impressionism on the left, impressionism on the right. The boy would grow up and have a really interesting life himself. He um, was very close to Manet. Um, and again, the kind of official story was that he was Manet's stepson, although some people um, debate that, but he had a really fascinating life himself. When Manet died, he actually ended up kind of um, cataloging all of his artwork and he took pictures or had um, photographs taken of all the paintings that Manet had in his studio at the time. He organized all of his papers. So historians love this boy or the man that he would grow up to be because he organized all of Manet's stuff um, in the months before he died and then the years that afterwards. So a really important figure in the history of art. And here's another interesting tidbit for you. So in 1889, six years after Edouard Manet's death, the New York collector Irwin Davis donated young lady, painting on the right, and boy with a sword, painting on the left, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They were the first works by Manet to enter the collection of an American museum. So imagine that it took six years after the death of Manet before any paintings of his ended up in museums in the United States. And it was these two. So Manet was pretty um, successful and popular during his lifetime, but get in galleries and museums and individuals and whatnot would have owned his paintings. But as far as making it across the Atlantic over here in the United States, they did have Manet paintings in the United States at this point in time, they were just owned by private individuals or they were in galleries and whatnot. They weren't actually in museums until this point in time. And again, the three paintings of his family. Um, it's not uncommon for artists, particularly impressionists, to do depictions of their family. Let me give you some other examples that you can see at the Met. This is Renoir's girlfriend, who would later be his wife by the seashore from 1883. So he would meet this woman, she would pose for him, and they fell in love and got married and had children and et cetera, et cetera, lived happily ever after. Here is Paul Cezanne's wife. So one of the kind of themes of this program today is if you wanna hook up with an artist, you have to be, I guess, prepared to pose for them because you frequently see the significant others of <laughs> artists depicted in their works. And it's not just limited to significant others, also children. So here is Monet doing a painting of his young son also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, Monet loved this painting. He hung it in his bedroom. He never put this painting up for sale. He had it with him the day he died. So he must have painted this, really liked it, and then kept it as a keepsake in his bedroom for the rest of his life, as opposed to the other paintings that he did, typically what he put up for sale. It's not a well-known Monet painting, but really cute that he depicts his son running his hobby horse. Um, now, Manet had a younger brother named Eugene, and Eugene ends up meeting and falling in love with a woman that he met through his brother, Edouard, a woman by the name of Bertha Morisot, and she actually ends up becoming a famous painter in her own right. So if you've heard Bertha Morisot, she is the sister-in-law of Edward Manet. She's married to his younger brother, Eugene, and they ended up having a daughter, Julie, and Julie herself ends up becoming an artist, although she's not as famous as her mom or her uncle. And if you wanna see Morisot's work, they have some of it at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She's also a really fascinating person. If you're not familiar with her art, you should check her out. Some pe times people confuse her with Mary Cassatt. They look at her paintings and they think, oh, that's hmm, look, maybe looks like a painting done by a woman, or they know it's a woman artist. So they sometimes get Mary Cassatt mixed up with Morisot, but two different individuals. She's very talented. She's getting a lot more kind of um, uh, fame and credit uh, in recent years. So that's nice to see. Again, she's Edouard Manet's sister-in-law. Manet was reason why uh, we don't really know what he looks like is he doesn't do the whole self-portrait thing very often. So here's a painting in Japan that he did, one self-portrait. He only did two self-portraits um, that were painted noteworthy items. 
this one from around the same time frame. So you have this one, the museum in Japan, and this one is in a private collection. If you want self-portraits though, just go see the Van Gogh painting at the Met. So they have one of his self-portraits and he's kind of got the, uh, I don't wanna say the market cornered, but <laughs> when you think of impressionism and self-portraits, you think of Vincent Van Gogh. So you can go see this one. This is one of his more famous self-portraits with a straw hat from 1887, painted this while he was living in Paris and you can see it at the Met. Let's get in kind of, we're into the home stretch of our program. Let's talk about the later works of Edouard Manet. These are the five paintings he did in that time frame. This young woman was one of the most famous or infamous women in Paris. She was a courtesan and she was known for not only her beauty, but for her wit and her intelligence and just a really fascinating person. And she ends up catching up with Manet and he does her portrait. This one was a quick one. He didn't, um, you can see this one is only partially complete as well. Not sure why he didn't finish this uh, down here. Here is a picture of her on the right. And again, she was a courtesan uh, and she was known again, not only for her beauty, but she was very intelligent, very witty. And she was also a really savvy businesswoman. Um, so just a really fascinating person. Again, at some point in time, we'll have to do a program on kind of the, the women behind the scenes of Impressionism, the, the girlfriends, the models, the mothers, the wives, the daughters, the mistresses, the patrons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We'll save that for some other day. Uh, here is an interesting quote about Manet by that great art critic, Ernest Hemingway, which you might not realize, but he actually was a, a great admirer of art. He said, Manet could show the bloom people have when they're still innocent and before they've been disillusioned. It's an interesting quote from Ernest Hemingway. Here is another portrait. This woman he had kind of an unusual relationship with. Um, she was quite a bit younger than he was. She was 25 years younger than Manet. And he met her because she was the daughter of a very uh, successful and wealthy Parisian jeweler. And he ends up painting her numerous times. She posed for him quite a bit, but he wrote her a lot of letters. and. When she would write him, she would be very friendly and whatnot. But when he wrote her, it would just all these compliments would keep flowing out. Uh, and you could tell he really admired her and really liked her a lot. Um, she just was kind of, uh, you know, keeping it friendly, so to speak. Uh, but he, he seemed like maybe he might have been interested in her, although there's no evidence that they ever had any kind of physical relationship. But it's interesting that the letters between the two of them, uh, her, Hers were much more kind of say professional and his were a lot more uh, endearing and complimentary and stuff like that. So he ends up painting her quite a few times. They have one of these works at the Met. And again, she's the daughter of a famous, successful, wealthy Parisian jeweler. And her sister, her younger sister, actually is in a famous portrait by Renoir. I we'll, don't have time to show you that today, but nicely done. This is an actor friend of Manet. We were talking before about the kind of circle of people he's hanging out with, other artists, writers, thought leaders. Uh, here's another example. This gentleman is a famous Shakespearean actor. If you look at the date this painting was made and the date Manet passed away, you can see we're in kind of the home stretch of his life and career, unfortunately. This one is not finished. Now, what you might be thinking is, wow, I really like these Manet paintings. I think I'd go out and buy one and hang it in my house. 
Uh, how much money would that cost? Uh, well, let's talk about that. So this is a famous Manet painting at another museum. It's at the J. Paul Getty Museum, a fabulous facility in Los Angeles for all of our uh, friends out in Southern California. This is called Spring from 1881. This was a series that Manet was gonna do where he was gonna depict the seasons through paintings of different women that were fashionably dressed, but he didn't get a chance to finish the series um, just because he had some health issues later on. But this is the most famous uh, one of this era. And again, this is spring from 1881, the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. So if you're wondering how much would it cost to buy a Manet painting for your house? Well, the Getty Museum acquired this painting seven years ago, and it's hard to say for sure how much exactly a painting is worth because it's they're all unique and it kind of just sometimes depends on the whim of the person who ends up buying it, but this is the most money ever spent for a Manet painting. The Getty bought this for $65 million uh, back in November of 2014. So if you want a Manet painting in your house, you might be able to get one for less than $65 million, um, but it's probably still gonna cost you a little bit uh, nonetheless. And the record price ever paid for a Manet was $65 million. So, wow. So check your bank statement and credit card balance and see what you got available. This is a touching painting. Um, we talked earlier about the still lifes that Manet made. He made still lifes during two different times in his career. Uh, he made them early on because he was practicing his technique and that's just what artists tend to do is they make still life paintings. He also made these at the end of his life and it's a really sad story because Manet has a lot of health problems and when he died he was only 51. And towards the last several months of his life, he's suffering from all these different health ailments, and he basically realizes that he might not make it. Um, and it got to a point where he was pretty much so uh, sick and so frail and so ill, he couldn't leave his Paris apartment. And the word started to get out that he was in very serious and declining health. And so he gets all these visitors from throughout kind of the art community and the art world, and they would bring him gifts. And one of the things that they would typically bring as a gift would be fruit or flowers or things like that. And so towards the very end of Monet, Manet's life, sorry, not Monet, Manet, um, you see him doing all these still lifes, basically uh, depictions of these gifts, the flowers and the fruits that he had been brought by uh, from friends and family members and people that admired him and respected him, people that he um, had supported when uh, trying to get help other artists get going and whatnot. So here's a perfect example are these strawberries that someone brought him. And you kind of, again, Manet does still lice frequently. These two on the left and this one on the top we saw earlier, he tended to do a lot early on in his career and then he did quite a few at the end. So this is the later one. And strawberries from 1882. So he painted this a few months before he passed away. So someone brought him these berries. And again, people were also bringing him flowers and whatnot, wanted to pay their respects, uh, talk to him one last time before he passed away because he had been in declining health for quite some time. And these are the last works that he made. So kind of this is our final category. Got a few more things to talk about before we wrap it up. So um, these are some other kind of late impressionist paintings that are well known that you can see at the Met. Paul Cezanne's The Card Players. This would have been done about 10 years after uh, Manet died. And so the impressionism movement is not something that only lasts like a couple of years. It extends for quite some time. We kind of, kind of think about the start of Impressionism is like say 1873, 74, um, this is on the 1890s. Um, just as a reminder, we've been recording this program. So if you joined us late, if you wanna to listen to it again, or if you know anyone else that'd be interested, it'll be on our YouTube channel um, probably sometime later today be happy to send out a link for the recording on that. And we have quite a few other art programs on our YouTube channel as well, if you want to go check that out. As far as things we have coming up in the near future, um, next weekend we're off to Paris to go do a program just like this, except there'll be the highlights at the Louvre, including the famous Mona Lisa. Uh, next weekend we're also going to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam.
the week after that, we're going to make a return visit to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. We just did that program a couple of weeks ago, um, but there was a lot of interest, so we thought we would repeat it. And again, this is a series, this Metropolitan Museum of Art and Impressions, this is a whole series of programs we'll do. So this one on Manet is the first one. The next one we're going to do will be on Degas, and you can join us for that. Kind of same exact type of program, except talking all about Manet, we'll talk all about Degas. And here's the date. So that if you want to take a screenshot of that with your phone or a picture. So the Louvre, Saturday, October 16th, Van Gogh Museum, Sunday, October 17th, Museum of Modern Art, Sunday, October 24th, and the Met, Degas and Impressionism on Sunday, November 7th. And again, we're Washington DC History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. We give people the opportunity to experience history and culture of Washington DC and the world. And We've been offering these live stream programs free since May of last year. Every single one that we've offered has been free. In fact, 99% of the people that attend our program do so for free. Um, however, we would not be able to continue offering these programs if 100% of the people that watch them did so for free because we incur expenses for um, our meetup site and our Zoom uh, account and stuff like that. If you've ever made a donation to support the work we do, we greatly appreciate that. Thank you very much. If you'd like to make a donation at some point in time to help support the work we do, you can do so by a PayPal or Venmo. There's the information for that. Let's talk about Postscript and Manet. So we talked about earlier the fact that it's really interesting that Manet was born uh, pretty much right across the river from the Louvre. This is like a less than five minute walk from here uh, across the bridge to here. And then he ends up getting buried in this cemetery over here, which is just a short walk from the Eiffel Tower. So buried across from the Eiffel Tower, born across from the Louvre. Manet born January 23rd, 1832, passed away at the age of 51 on April 30th, 1883. Um, Manet is a very well-known impressionist artist, very well-known artist. I wonder if he would be more uh, well-known, more popular if he didn't have the health issues he had late in life, or if he would have lived longer. I mean, think about maybe kind of like a, a sports comparison. Um, sometimes there's a lot of great athletes that their career isn't quite all it could have been because their career gets cut short because of injuries and kind of maybe a little bit, kind of sort of um, similar with Manet. His life gets cut short, he dies at the age of 51 from various health ailments. Um, here is the Eiffel Tower off in the background. And if you look over here to the right, here is Manet's gravesite. Here is the front view. Again, he's not as recognizable of a figure, partially because he didn't do the whole self-portrait thing <laughs> like Vincent van Gogh did, but we won't hold that against him. Here is another view of his gravesite. So next time you're in Paris, or if you visit Paris at some point in time, make sure you stop by Manet's gravesite and pay your respects to this great artist. And again, we were talking before about modern art, and it really gets its foundation in Impressionism. So we saw this painting a week ago when we were talking about the Museum of Modern Art in New York. You have Picasso's and all these other artists that come along and make abstract art and you know how did that end up happening well it's really kind of this amazing progression if you think about artwork of the modern era which is very abstract kind of anything goes um, that's after impressionism uh, you think about before impressionism very traditional style focus on making things look as realistic as possible and then in between those two the realist style and the abstract style, you have Impressionism, which again, Manet is a great bridge uh, between these different times. So his two paintings there, uh, you can see the progression from this to his work and then from his work on to more modern art. So again, not only is the work really interesting and fascinating and beautiful and cool to look at, but just also really influential uh, in the terms of the impact it had on subsequent artists, which is why one reason why a lot of historians spend time studying the Impressionists because of the impact and influence they had on subsequent artists. 
So again, we were talking before about how today it's really easy to kind of focus on the aesthetic beauty. And hey, you know what? If you just want to look at the paintings because they're nice to look at and they're beautiful, that's totally fine. Um, however, if you want kind of a deeper uh, understanding or appreciation, uh, it really is kind of helpful to just to think about the the change that was come about by these avant-garde thought leaders like Manet and Monet and Van Gogh and how the changes that they made end up leading to what is now known as modern art. And that happens because of these great paintings by none other than Edouard Manet. Born January 23rd, 1832, passed away April 30th, 18. 83. So that is the end of our program. Thank you very much. It was great to walk you through the Metropolitan Museum of Art, albeit virtually, uh, in this program focusing on the fascinating life and career of Edouard Manet and give you a chance to see some of his paintings that perhaps you might not have seen before, uh, perhaps tell you a little bit of the stories behind some of those works, either ones you've seen before or not, and also look at some other um, artwork by Manet at different museums or by different artists. So that is the end. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great rest of your Saturday. Hope to see you soon, either online at one of these programs or maybe even perhaps in person at one of the museums somewhere. So thanks so much for joining us. Stay safe. Have a great rest of your weekend. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.